It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I'm Dan. I'm Kate. And um, we are doing a uh, classical, a cl- not classical, classic musicals month mm-hmm. this month. Uh, we have already covered Singing in the Rain. And Meet Me in St. Louis. Meet Me in St. Louis. And we're going to be moving on to one of a longstanding favorite of mine, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I'm very excited because I have not seen this one. There's some problematic stuff in it. I'm not surprised given the era it was created. Yeah. I, at this point, I just kind of anticipate it. I think that's fair. Pretty much the entire plot <laughs> is a big issue. Well, you'll you'll see. I'm sure I'm going to notice. But let's talk about the movie itself and how it got made. Tell me about it. So Jack Cummings is a Hollywood produ- was a Hollywood producer. He'd always been a big fan of the Sabin women. S O B B I N apostrophe women. As in like a Sabin, as in like a shortened version of sobbing, as in crying. Mm-hmm. As in short for sobbing. As in crying. As in crying. I didn't know that was a genre. Uh, it's not a, a genre. It's a story. It's a modern version of an old Greek story. Okay. About the uh, Sabina women. S A B I N E. Okay. Um. It's a a story about Romans kidnapping the Sabina women mm. for marriage purposes. Mm. Not great. No, not great. So Jack Cummings really wanted to make that into a movie, like a musical movie. You know what would be great about this story of kidnapping for marriage purposes? Song and dance. Song and dance. There's only one issue. The whole plot? No. Okay. The rights were uh, held by Joshua Logan, who is mm-hmm. uh, an acclaimed Broadway director. So, so presumably, if it was a good idea to put this whole thing to song and dance, it would have been done already. Right. Except Joshua Logan didn't do anything for the five years that he had the rights to the story. I mean, um, I don't know the guy, but maybe he bought the rights so that nobody would put it to song and dance. It's possible. But then if you don't do anything with, uh, I found this out doing this research, if you have the the rights mm-hmm. and don't do anything with them, mm-hmm. uh, like if you, you buy them f- with intent to do something and then don't, your uh, option on it expires. Like what if you're trying to do something and it repeatedly fails? So like y- you purposefully make it badly like technically you're acting on it yeah i don't know exactly how that would work he dropped the ball he did drop the ball and mgm picked that ball up for forty thousand dollars okay which when was this uh this was 1952 okay uh 1953 time frame the movie was released in 54 two good years uh yes my mom was born in 52 my dad was born in 54 nice my parents were born in 63 and 64. <laughs> but uh, $40,000 in 53 was uh, about $371,000 today. Okay. So well, not that terribly much, but still, still a fair chunk of change. Yeah. So this movie was, like, they started making the movie, or, like, planning on making the movie and everything, mm-hmm. uh, right along the same the same time that MGM was making Brigadoon. Okay. Another great musical, Gene mm-hmm. Kelly. Mm-hmm. Just phenomenal, phenomenal movie. But MGM was like, oh, we're putting two musicals together at the same time. One of these is going to be better than the other one. Oh, no. Why can't we all be successful, MGM? So we're going to just put more money into Brigadoon. Oh, and never going to see it again. They basically saw Seven Brides for Seven Brothers as a B movie. Okay. To Brigadoon's A. Right. Okay. They continually slashed the budget for Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Oh. To put more money into Brigadoon. Oh, no. And that proved to be a bit of a challenge. I imagine it would be. For uh, director Stanley Donen, mm-hmm. who had 
done some work uh, on other musicals in the past, On the Town and Singing in the Rain, he co-directed with Gene Kelly. This was one of his first solo directorial jobs. Mm -hmm. And he saw it as like a test. Oh. We'll we'll talk about some of the financial things later on. Okay. Let's get to putting together the rest of the movie. So uh-huh. uh they hired Albert Hackett and Francis Goodrich as mm-hmm. the as the scriptwriters. Mm-hmm. And they were interested in a uh, strapping rough and tumble man who could also sing for the role of Adam. Okay. And so they went with Howard Keel. Okay. And they cast Jane Powell as Millie, mm-hmm. the female lead mm-hmm. of the movie. MGM at this point was like, well, budget wise, we're getting pretty tight. So here's what we'll do we'll hire actors for the other brothers and, and brides, and that'll be fine. Music wise, let's just use existing American folk songs. Oh, another movie made up of songs that don't really have anything to do with the movie? Yeah. It Is that a thing that happened a lot? Proved It did happen a lot, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but it proved to be very difficult to find folk songs to insert into an already written story rather oh, than no. writing the story around the songs like what happened in Singing in the Rain. Okay. So... Stanley Donan was able to talk Jack Cummings and MGM out of using existing songs and uh-huh. convince them to write, or to, to pay for mm-hmm. real songs, new songs. Uh, so they hired Johnny Mercer to write the lyrics and Gene DePaul to mm-hmm. do the music for it. Then they were looking at choreographers and Stanley Donan knew basically from the get-go that he wanted to work with Michael Kidd. Mm-hmm. And Kidd... Did not want to do it. Oh, no. He's like, look, you've got these dirty, smelly, rugged mountain men Mm -hmm. as your characters here. And you expect the audiences to be okay with them just singing and dancing? We're going to get laughed out of the theater. I'm not putting my career on the line for this. No, thank you. So then uh, Donan was like, how about I play the music for you? Mm -hmm. then you see if you change your mind. Kid Mm -hmm. said, okay. Listen to the music, said, nope. (laughs) This is not going to... Hard no. Still no. Still, main issue is that, like, dancing is not going to be a thing that these people do. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) Stanley Donan was like, okay, fine. Here's what you do. We'll hire you to choreograph the movements that the actors make while they're singing their songs. It doesn't have to be dancing. Mm Mm-hmm. Just choreograph the movements, which is something that we see in a couple songs Mm -hmm. uh, that is like, for instance, uh, one of my favorite songs from this movie, Lonesome Polecat, Mm -hmm. uh, is more like it's not dancing. It's just rhythmic moving, (laughs) if that makes sense. Okay. I I think I need to see it. Doing things to a rhythm. And then that also turned into, okay, well, we can do a couple dance things here and then put together an incredibly choreographed movie. Mm -hmm. What I think a lot of musicals have going for them is, you know, the songs. Mm -hmm. I think this one is, the music is great, but the dancing in this movie Mm -hmm. is amazing. There is one particular number, the barn raising scene, Mm -hmm. that is an amazing dance number. We'll talk about that too. But like, the dancing in this movie is just so good. Yeah. Because Michael Kidd is an amazing choreographer. It's true. So he agreed. They they brought him on and he's like, okay, well, if we're going to do dancing, I'm going to need you to hire me some dancers, not just actors. Yeah. And MGM's like, here's the tough thing about that. We don't have any on contract. So we don't have any that I mean, we, we can... do, but they're all in Brigadoon right now. Right. <laughs> Suck it. <laughs> right. Uh, we don't have anyone we can force to do this movie, so we'll just, you know... Put we'll, up some flyers at the rec center and wish for the best. Pretty much. Uh, no, we'll uh, we'll hire actors. And Kid was like, no, I, I like, really need dancers, though, if I'm going to do this right. And already having Howard Keel and um, Jane Powell, they had six brothers to cast and six brides who they didn't really have a hard time finding uh 
dancers to play the brides. Mm -hmm. But for the brothers, they hired four dancers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tommy Rawl, Matt Maddox, Mark Platt, and Jacques D'Amboise. And then the other two brothers, they got Jeff Richards, a former baseball player. Athletes are naturally lithe. Oh, he was not. Oh, no. He doesn't dance much in this movie. He oh, had no. two left feet, which is a real shame because he was paired oh. up with Julie Newmar. A lot of dancers, or a lot of a lot of athletes usually are. Right? I'm disappointed. Yeah, Julie Newmar is a real great dancer, but she didn't really get the opportunity to dance much in this movie because Aww. she was paired with Jeff Richards. Oh. And then they got uh, Russ Tamblin, mm-hmm. who had been in Father of the Bride and some like mm-hmm. wartime okay. movies. Yeah. And had made a name for himself as an actor, but like didn't hadn't been in any musicals or anything mm-hmm. to this point. So casting is complete, and now it's time to get going on filming. Mm-hmm. Donan wants to film on location in Oregon mm-hmm. because Oregon's beautiful for yeah. looking through mountain areas. Like it is. Let's not have cheesy painted sets yeah. in the background, please. MGM said no. Of course. Way too much money. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, the movie takes course over a year, and the seasons are important to parts of the movie, and it would take way too long to do. Yeah. So they had to do it with cheesy painted sets. I mean, granted, I haven't seen these. I don't know how cheesy they are, but like painted sets are not always cheesy. There can be incredibly beautiful matte paintings. There can. But I guess... It's been a while since I've... Like, when I watched it Yeah, but you know, we're probably going to... We either have or will have an HD version, and it's going to look worse than normal. That is true. (laughs) I am prepared. As we have found with the past several movies. So the main reason that money was really, like, tied up in this budget Mm -hmm. was because of CinemaScope. Uh Oh. CinemaScope, I'm sorry, CinemaScope was a new way of making movies. Mm Mm-hmm. Mainly, it was a wider format. Wider? Wider. Okay. Not whiter. It sounded like you said whiter. I was going to say, given the time, how do you do that? Right. It's already pretty damn white. Spoiler, this movie is pretty Pretty damn white. white. I kind of expected that much. Yeah. Cinemascope is like better colors, Mm -hmm. wider format, which is really useful for a movie where you've got a bunch of people (laughs) that are going to need to be in shots at one time. If I remember correctly, there's like maybe four or five years ago, there was a commercial that was going around like showing, I don't know for sure because I haven't seen the whole thing, but I believe it was a clip from uh, from this film, but showing the difference between a widescreen uh, and a full screen format and how it like trims off the edges and takes out so much of what you see. Yeah. Yeah. Full screen, guys. Don't do it. Don't do full screen. Don't do it. Widescreen all the way. So here's the problem, mm-hmm. though, about CinemaScope. Okay. It required different film. Of course it did. And so then not every theater was, was able, able to, to show. show. Oh, no. But well, Jack I mean, Cummings had a solution. Forced scarcity can run up numbers. It can. That was not... Not the solution. <laughs> Jack Cummings' solution was we film in both oh, gosh. sets. In, in both standard and cinemascope. How is that the better option? Okay. Let's be very tight with our budget, but let's but basically let's shoot twice. two movies because Jesus. they did, like, the mornings mm-hmm. were dedicated to. Cinemascope and the afternoons were dedicated to standard. Oh God, they, they weren't even. It's doing not even simultaneous. Oh no! So, what a hot mess! It was a hot mess. Hot mess. It's incredible that the movie was like that. They were able to put everything together, considering mm-hmm. they were shooting two movies on the budget of one, basically. Oh, Jesus. But okay. both versions exist still today. Okay. Um, like most of the. DVDs that are released are CinemaScope versions because mm-hmm. it's the good one. Yeah. But they also have, if you want to watch the standard, then you can see the standard. I would be interested to see them side by side. Me too. Me too. I had that thought a lot while I was doing this research. It's like, I would love to just see what the differences are. Mm-hmm. So, production's underway. Mm-hmm. And Howard Keel has some issues with Adam. Oh, no. 
he didn't like the timing of the reprise of one of the songs when you're in love mm -hmm. that he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. He's like, at this point, my character doesn't really understand love. So I really don't think he would sing that right now. Later on, yes. Right now, no. Yeah. And then he had a soliloquy number in the cabin mm -hmm. in the winter times when he's alone and sad. Mm -hmm. And he's like, this is too similar to the show Carousel where there's a song that's very similar to this. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. So the writers, Hacker, Hackett and Goodrich, mm -hmm. like they got into arguments with Keel about it to the point where they walked off the set. Oh, they were done. I mean... That's fair. I don't so, know. I wasn't there, but I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. Dorothy Kingsley then took over the writing. Yeah. Go, lady. Yeah. Uh, Keel said in his autobiography that he felt bad about uh, Hackett and Goodrich quitting. Mm -hmm. But he also still thinks he was right and knows that uh, Jack Cummings had his back on it and agreed with him. Mm, that's fair. Yeah. At this point... The movie was still called The Sobbin' Women. God, Jesus. MGM wasn't sure how much that would entice people to go see it. I mean, I'm at it like a 0.0%. .0%. They're like, this doesn't this isn't going to show the fun side. Like, the fun part of abducting women to marry? Yep. So instead, they changed the title to A Bride for Seven Brothers. Ugh. No. That was the censor's reaction, too. I should get a job. <laughs> so then they changed it to Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Better. Bit of a mouthful, but fine. A little bit. Multiple brides for multiple brothers. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the barn raising number, but I think I want to do that after you've seen it. Okay. So before we go and watch it, I just have one more piece of information, which is that MGM really wanted a dream ballet sequence which was very popular at the time uh, see singing in the rain mm -hmm. on the town mm -hmm. uh but fortunately uh donan was like no we don't need that we're not gonna we're not gonna do that i'm putting my foot down now <laughs> but a sandbag could nope, fall on his head nope foot is down down foot foot down I love classic musicals, but mm -hmm. yeah, the the dream they sequence can be really to justify sometimes. they really can be the it's the we're going to justify a crazy weird dance thing mm -hmm. with a dream sequence is just overdone and dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's I think all that I've got for previewing notes. You want to go watch this movie? Let's go watch a movie. Let's go watch a movie. And we're back. We're back. Yay! Hooray! It's a fun movie. Yeah. It's a very problematic movie. It is riddled with problems. But let's talk about that in a bit. Okay. Let's talk about some fun things first. Okay. The barn... Barn raising scene. Barn raising scene. Yes. Just fantastically fun. Mm -hmm. So they rehearsed for three weeks to, to get that Seems about right. scene down. Originally... Neither Jeff Richards nor Russ Tamblin were supposed to be in it. Oh no! Uh, in the like in the main dancing parts, mm -hmm. but they would come and watch the rehearsals frequently. Well, that's just because it's good fun to watch. Them. Yeah. And uh, Michael Kidd went up to Russ Tamblin and was like, "Someone told me that you can tumble." Mm -hmm. And so Russ was like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah I can," and did a backflip mm -hmm. right there. And Kidd. It was like, okay, well, we are putting you in this number, and <laughs> we're going to make you do more dancing stuff. And that changed his life. Aww. Tamlin went on to be in West Side Story, most famously, mm -hmm. uh, and was like known for being a dancer as well as an actor. Yeah. And I mean, he does some really great stunts, some, some good stunt. I mean... Yeah. Everyone did good stunting in that number. Yeah. It's just yeah. so great to watch. So it's incredibly athletic. Yes, very much so. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like that, this movie really skyrocketed Russ Tamblin's career, which is great because mm -hmm. I fucking love Russ Tamblin. Yeah. There's a phenomenal in West Side Story. He's in my favorite movie ever, The Haunting. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. Just like right up my alley. 
<laughs> so when this movie came out, it was a huge hit to MGM's surprise, of course, uh, because they were expecting it to be a B movie, not that. Like, like I don't mean to like I don't want to shoot it down in any way, but I also feel like I feel like that makes studios feel like they can get away with slashing budgets left and right and being real dicks to producers. Yeah, and I like that. I find regrettable. Agreed. Otherwise, you know, I'm glad that they they made, were able to make good with what they had. Yeah, it eclipsed Brigadoon completely and was nominated for five Oscars. Dang, uh, including Best Picture, Color Cinematography. Yeah, the colors were really gorgeous. The colors were very gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, film editing, mm-hmm. best screenplay, and it won for best scoring of a musical picture. But it has a troublesome plot. Yeah. Yes. So for it, those who yes, haven't yeah. seen the movie, aren't familiar with it, we're going to run down the, the plot real quick. Uh, Adam goes into town. He is a mountain farmer. Mountain man. Mountain man. And he goes into town singing the song, Bless Your Beautiful Hide. But he, but he sings that after Tr- he goes into the, he goes into the store and he's trading uh, some beaver pelts, Hugh Glass style. And he asks how much that's good for and he gets a ridiculous amount in exchange for it, like 30 pounds of tobacco and two buckets of lard and a new plow and a bunch of other... And then, like, just casually says, and a wife, if you got one. And like, that that's not a super creepy thing to say starts, in any store ever. Starts the the theme for the movie, which is largely treating women as objects. And the only person sold. in the whole movie who objects to that is the elderly lady in the store. Yep. She gives him an earful. An, an earful, and it's great. Mm-hmm. And then is immediately shot down. And then, we, yeah, we don't really see much of her for the rest of the movie. Yeah, I mean, she shows up in a couple of places. A couple of, but she doesn't have, you know. She doesn't have any more substantial role. No. But then. Uh, uh, but then he sings Bless Your Beautiful Hide, a song which, uh, in which a a slim, nice, uh, like a, 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 a pretty looking slim wo- young woman walks by and he says, oh yeah, that's like something like, oh yeah, she's real, she's real pretty, but a little too thin. And then the next woman goes by and she is a, more uh curvaceous woman and he says oh but the shape of that one <laughs> like beautiful fuck eyes you. but oh that size fuck you buddy yeah no he definitely goes around sings a song objectifying all the women in the town and then and sees then a sassy woman that he's that can that cook can can cook and clean and, and chop holds wood her own. and can can do all of the things that he needs manual labor wise. So he's gonna marry her, and he goes and convinces her to marry him. Literally, just saying like, "I have a house. How about it?" Yep. So, he, and she goes along. She goes with along it. with it, and he takes her he gets married they get married that day and he takes her back to his farm where he's conveniently left out the fact that he has six brothers none of whom know how to clean up after themselves and his expectation for millie is that to clean and organize the house cook for all of them and just generally be a workhorse and so then she teaches the brothers how to be decent people Mm mm-hmm Takes them to a barn raising. Oh, but first they have their 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 wedding night where she's like, uh, "Sure, I'll I'll work on your farm, but I'm not uh, I'm not gonna be a wife to you." So then, to save face for his brothers, he climbs out the window and sets up like he's going to sleep in the tree. And she's like, "Well, that's not practical." And he's like, "It was your idea." Yeah, and I'm passive like, aggressive. I'm like, "No, asshole." She oh. just said she didn't want to sleep with you tonight because you've done nothing to earn her trust. Yeah. It's insane. And you literally own up to the fact that you were absolutely expecting the woman you brought home to do all of your servant work. Yeah. So then she teaches the brothers how to be decent around women and takes them to a barn raising where they meet the women that they just inexplicably fall in love with and somehow they also They're, kind of oh fall in God. love with. Oh my God, it's rampant. It's rampant in this movie. It is. Uh, and so then, throughout a crazy confluence of events, they decide that they're going to go kidnap these women from the town and 
bring them back to the farm Which to is, marry them. Um, and and by by means of causing an avalanche on like the passage that you have to go through to get to town to prevent anybody else from getting to them. Right. And then Millie is horrified. Millie is rightly horrified. Uh, vanishes all of the men to the barn and says, you're not allowed in this house. The right course of action yeah, there. The, the correct response. So then Adam pitches himself a little bitch fit and says, "Yeah, but you were just talking about how you wanted all the boys to get married. You were just saying that like yesterday. Uh, so I kidnapped all these girls. But if you're going to be like that, then I'm going to go hide in the other cat, the fur trapping cabin, even farther up the mountain where he goes and he hides for, I want to say, at least seven months, <laughs> at least seven months, because it turns out Millie is pregnant and she has the baby while Adam is still up Gone. in the cabin. And like she had to have only been two months at most maybe along. Yeah. But. Uh, all the brides, quote unquote, all, all the all women, of the kidnapped women, fall in love with their kidnappers anyway. Stockholm syndrome. And so, by the time the snow thaws out, the townspeople go up the pass to get to the farm, and then, uh, and then the women cleverly trick them into trick their families into letting them get married to the brothers by all claiming that the baby is theirs. Right. So the only way to make that right is a shotgun wedding. Literally, there's... Six shotguns yeah. for six brides. It's insane. For six brothers. There's a lot of issue There's so with much. the plot. Oh, here. and Adam comes back because the baby was a girl, mm-hmm. and as the father of a daughter, he now, now understands he understands feminism. Fuck that. <laughs> so the studio just embraced it. Why? They're just like, this is going to be a movie about kidnapping women there's so, literally a song about it because adam gets the idea from a book that belongs to millie and he's like I, I learned it i learned it from watching you millie so the brothers have alphabetical nickname or not nicknames alphabetical names Names. we've got adam benjamin caleb daniel ephraim frankincense and gideon mm-hmm. so here's the marketing ploy the, what they used the slogan that they used okay adam Abducted Millie. Benjamin brought Dorcas. No. Caleb caught Ruth. No. Daniel detained Martha. Ah. Uh, Ephraim eloped with Liza. That's the most consensual so far. Frank fetched Sarah. No. Gideon grabbed Alice. No. They- it's not even accurate because Millie willingly married Adam and went along because she thought she was getting some peace and quiet and then she got a fucking cabin full of boys. Yeah. Yep. And that's the least problematic part. So, let's talk about the tropes in this. There's that fantastic trope. Like I said, it is it, ev- everybody is sick with it in this of, I've known you for 30 seconds. I love you. Yes, definitely. I feel like that was, maybe it was like a bigger thing like in that era of movie making. I guess, but like it's still... It's still problematic now. It's just not nearly as... Uh, now you were like 50 50 likely to say like, people were like oh we've known each other for 30 seconds or i've known you for 30 seconds i don't even know you right but you know yeah it's nutty we do have the uh basically the the trope of dance off yeah dance off there's the trope of men folk don't know how to care for themselves as humans mm-hmm. one woman comes along one woman and fixes comes along it all. and fixes everything because she's sassy. Yeah, she's sassy and she won't put up with their shenanigans. Right. We've got the trope of, you know, I mean, like we discussed, the the Stockholm Syndrome yeah. of, mm. oh, well, now I'm in love. And here's the thing about it is that, like, I don't think there was really a like moment when they fell in love with the brothers. Mm-mm. They just sung the song about being a bride in June and, like, Millie's going to have a baby. Now we're all wanting to well, get no, married but, and I mean, have babies that, ourselves. Before that, they were making doe eyes they were. at them. But like at most, that's flirtatious. Right. Not, okay, yeah, let's get married. Some people are just trying to get that ring. Yeah, that's true. You. You. What? <laughs> no. 
I am a I am a small sassy package. You are a small <laughs> sassy package, just like Jane Powell. Mm-hmm. And I'm a tall baritone voice, Beardo. beardy <laughs> mountain man, <laughs> just like Howard Keel. Daniel Weirdo Beardo Spencer. <laughs> also, the that this pack of loners on the mountain are all fucking gingers. <laughs> Yeah, I do love that. So they died. Just the... a big old pack of it's 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 the Weasleys 1.0. Right. Or no, like 0.5. They dyed everybody's hair to be that that red color. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think to go with Howard Keel's mm-hmm. naturally. Really, because his looked the fakest. Yeah. To I me. can't remember exactly who it was who had the head. Somebody had but beautiful hair. They also decided they wanted to go. I with I mean, red like it hair. wasn't super bad, but like. I was like, oh, that's a lot of dyed hair. Yeah. Uh, they decided they wanted to go with the red hair because in the barn raising scene, they wanted to make it obvious who was a Pontipi brother yeah. and who was a townsperson, even though the costumes they were wearing yeah. uh, would stand out. And the fact that we'd seen these actors for half the movie would stand out, mm-hmm. but they still wanted it to be very clear. Yeah. I mean, I, it was a fact. I mean, it's effective whether or not it's specifically as effective as intended in that scene or if it just like it helps that they look like brothers because otherwise they like some of them have some resemblance but you know like if you really really stood them all next to each other and like critiqued it all not necessarily very much like look alike yeah in there and it's just so funny during that barn raising scene seeing jeff richards just kind of standing off just in the the background just being like Go get him, bros. <laughs> You're my brothers. You're doing the mean stuff. If anybody brings out some sport equipment, that's right. Count me in. I'm going to sport up on you, but till then, I'm just going to supervise. <laughs> the the also the trope of, you know, these grown men are just going to like go at the food like they're wild animals. Mhm. Yes. Like their cookie monster. I will say I did not I did I did not and I was looking, I did not see one single person of color. Oh yeah, no, there was there were no people of color in this movie. It's very white, very male centric. Yeah. It's I mean, it's cute but very problematic. Very problematic. Um, but v- still very cute. No. Yeah, I mean, cute things can be problematic. Yep. But, you know, it's how we learn. It's how we grow. Exactly. So, as always, you can find us on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, uh, YouTube. Soon to be, uh, our stuff is going to be up on Spotify. Mm-hmm. You can always reach out to us on uh, Facebook and Twitter, at Subverted Tropes. And we've got our... Uh, Gmail, uh, subvertedtropecast at gmail.com. If you want to send us your thoughts, you know, questions, criticisms, suggestions Suggestions. of movies to do, suggestions of things to, you know, we do like to pair some food with movies uh, Mm -hmm. sometimes, so that would be a lot of fun. And of course, we are always going to be putting up uh, info on the blog, subvertedtropecast.wordpress.com. We've got some adorable pictures of Ripley, uh, our our Producer. producer. Ripley is going to be featured on the blog with... Uh, she was curled up in the lap. Was it was up. real cute. It was so sweet. Good producing. As always, a big thank you to our logo designer, Gracie Boland. You can find her on Instagram at a fandom doodler or Etsy at that crazy princess. Uh, she has a bunch of beautiful bookmarks and all, all kinds of great art stuff. And uh, she's very talented and we're very proud of her. And we're very proud to have her as our, our logo designer. Indeed. So I think that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Yep. Uh, Our next episode is going to be our last musicals episode, and that's going to be Chicago. So we'll jump in. I'm very excited for it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, February is going to be an interesting month for us. We are going to completely flip the script. Going, yes. As um, almost as an apology for all of these extremely extremely white white musicals, Uh, we're going to be doing our best to honor uh, Black History Month. Um, So we will reveal some of those titles closer to then. Indeed. And there's one exception, uh, which is we're going to be going on a cruise. So we're going to... We're going to do Titanic because we have a tremendous sense of irony. For a while we're out on that cruise. But... Anyway. 
Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. We we really love to have you. You're the greatest of all of the listeners. If you have a, a hot second, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us a rating, giving us a review, subscribing, or telling your friends, we'd really appreciate it. Indeed. Uh, but yeah, I think that's going to be it for us. So all right. have a good one. Bye.